doesn't mean we don't fight a Hitler or we don't fight a Stalin. But first of all, let us be mindful of the Hitler and the Stalin that lives inside us. You know what? I got you at a good time, didn't I? Because last night there was big news in my city because I'm in Bristol. The statue was taken down. What's going on? Well, I, I think that this is a, a really interesting and rather, like I said, rather timely that we're uh, that we're speaking to gay today because, of course, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, the statue of Ed, Edward Colston, who was a, a slave trader, um, was uh, ripped off its plinth and cast into the harbour, and uh, and four people put on trial, and yesterday they were they were uh, acquitted, and they were acquitted of, I believe, damaging public property and. And uh, and they were acquitted by a jury, and uh, and there's a number of kind of fascinating things about that because, firstly, obviously they were guilty. They were guilty of what they were charged of. This was not a a trial about ideology. It was actually a trial about whether they damaged property they had no right to damage. And of course, they were guilty of that. And the jury took the view: well, that the, the symbol of Edward Colston was so egregious, was so horrific. That it that the uh, the crime merited no punishment, and uh, and there are people today saying, well, that sets a legal precedent. Well, it doesn't because it's a jury trial, so it doesn't set a legal precedent. Nobody's going to have to nobody's going to have to sit down and say, well, this decision was made. Now, any statute that comes down, we've got to follow that. It doesn't set that kind of precedent. But the question that was asked, I've I've watched today really a number of quite interesting debates about it across different media really, and there was an interesting discussion this morning. Um, between the barrister who defended the, uh, the four people who tore the statue down and Julie Hartley Brewer on talk radio. Right. She was saying, well, OK, we agree it doesn't set a legal precedent, but does it set a moral precedent? So does it sit down and say that if something offends us to the degree to which you claim to be offended by this statue, does it open the gates of destruction? Does it legitimise violence? Does it legitimise? Does it legitimise even symbolic retribution? And uh, and and so it's quite interesting in that sense. But but more interesting, really, I, I think, is is the whole issues around not just Colston, but around you know statue and destruction icon- iconoclasm in in general, really, which is which is really the main theme of my book. I mean, my book is, of course, it covers twenty one statues from Hatshepsut in ancient Egypt right through to. I think the last chapter is on uh, Frederick Douglass, um, and uh, the uh, who was born in 1818 and who escaped slavery in 1838 and became a great abolitionist and great orator and and the first Black American to become a U.S. Marshal. So it covers a, a really broad span of of history and 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 the question here is what is really going on here? And my book is about it's called a history of love and hate. And and what interests me really as a philosopher and also as a psychologist. Uh, is the fact how do we love, and uh, and how do we hate, and and how do we become polarized, and how do we become intolerant? There's a a fascinating quote by a black American woman, a uh, Sophia Nelson, and she said, "What I fear," she said, she was talking about Confederate monuments, and even as a black woman, black American woman, she was saying, "I don't care." She said, "I don't care about dead people who have been dead for 150 years. What I care about," she said, "is the hatred we are we are experiencing now." In she wrote this in 20, she said this in 2017. And, and I think that's the issue we've got to, I think, deal with both on an individual and a collective level, um, how we become divided and how instead of being able to disagree with people or hold an opposing view, how that quickly dispen- descends into a spiral of hate and intolerance. And, and that, to me, really is, is, is truly terrifying, because the reason I chose the, the statues that I did really in the in the book was because they were all destroyed they were all violently destroyed of course so it's not every statue that comes down is violently destroyed but these were and each one has a story and it's inevitably a story of of polarization and and crucially it's a it's a story of different identity groups with different ideologies colliding what is edward colston's story just to just to narrow in on that for a moment colston was a slave trader you know he he transported about eighty five thousand slaves as he was under the heads of the royal african company and and he died in 1721. He transported about 85,000 slaves from, from Africa and, and about, I believe, 20,000 uh, uh, um, black Africans died in, uh, in transit. And some considerable time after his death, it was decided that 
that because he left a huge bequest to the city of Bristol on the back of his money, you know, arms houses, hospitals, schools. It was, a, it was quite an enormous act of philanthropic generosity. And so you have this figure who makes all his money out of human misery and slavery. And then after his death, distributes that money to support the poor and to support the people from the city uh, where he was where he was based. So I, I think that the, the, so the narrative is, and there was protests as early as 1821, um, a Reverend Howells, I believe it was, raised the first protest about the statue of Colston saying, do we really want a statue of this man in the center of Bristol? He's a slave trader. By what right do we, do we think that this is, you know, celebrating what it says on the plinth, which one of the most virtuous sons of the city of Bristol, one of the finest and most virtuous sons of the city of Bristol. What type of virtue are we talking about here? And so the protests have been going for an awful long time. And, and, and certainly in the last 20 to 25 years, there have been repeated attempts. I think the first act of vandalism against the statue was in the late 90s. And there's been repeated attempts, really, to say this is not appropriate in a modern cosmopolitan multicultural city to be celebrating a slave trade. And there was attempts by the mayor, Marvin Rees, to negotiate with a society of merchant adventurers with their own history in, in, in the slave trade to try and re, redefine the statue by changing the wording on the plinth. But they couldn't agree it because the society of merchant adventurers didn't want to um, didn't want to have reference to children on it, and they wanted to tone down some of the language. So the mayor, one of Britain's first black mayors, said, "No, we're not. We're not having this." He was attempting a compromise, and it didn't work. So, hence, we then move forward to I think 2018, when there was a remarkable addition to the statue made, where some protesters put a model of a slave ship stretching out from the statues. They were reinterpreting the statue. They say, okay, you want Colston to stand, but he will stand alongside the symbol of the misery that he caused. And, uh, and, and that model of a slave ship also included references, of course, to modern slavery, because we have tens of millions of people in slavery today. This isn't a historical thing. And, and, but again, that was, that was taken down. And of course, then eventually in the, in the light of the, the killing of, of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protest that swept through much of the Western world in 20, God, 2020, wasn't it now? In 2020, you have uh, the statue being torn off its plinth and, and the protesters yesterday, when after they were acquitted, saying, um, we did this because, not because we're necessarily anti-democratic, but because democracy failed. It failed to take this egregious symbol out of a public space and to consign it to the dustbin of history. So, but when when Colson was taken down, it was he was then put in a museum. But then there was even a debate about that. There's an organisation which is defending um, um, statues, and so we should leave these statues standing called Save Our Statues. And they they said no. They they laid Colston on his back, and one commentator said like a fallen chess piece, and in a museum still covered in all the graffiti. And and they said no. We should have him standing. You know, so therefore that that also fell apart. So so what it bears, and it's fascinating. Yesterday, really, that one of the protesters, as soon as they come out of the the um, the the hearing, kneels down and does the the Black Lives Matter salute. So what we have here is quite clearly an issue about identity and an issue about and the, the, the generally about the culture wars and and social justice, which is happening all around us. But and uh, and I don't think anybody those defending uh, the statue standing or those wanting to tear it down is, is suggesting that let's bring back slavery, let's celebrate slavery. That's not really what's at issue here. But if I can just make a, a point here about a documentary, it was a brilliant documentary. Uh, I think David Olisoga, the, the historian, wrote a wonderful book called Black and British. He, he made this documentary about the toppling of the Colston statue. And there's a fascinating section in that. And uh, where I, you're familiar with Jen Reed, maybe the black, right. the black woman who who did the Black Lives Matter salute, right. and a resin statue of her was made after Colston fell, and then put on the plinth where Colston was before being taken down 48 hours later by the council. So that got huge publicity. And uh, but what didn't get publicity was the actions of uh, of a white working class lad from Bristol called Nigel Horlock, and he was featured in this documentary and. 
And what was fascinating about him was he stood on the plinth protesting against the fact the statue had been taken down and holding a Union Jack in front of his, his body, you know. And, and this documentary traced him, so if they found him, you know. And, and, and he said, you know, in, in, he took the camera crew and the, the film crew to where he'd been brought up, a working class estate in Bristol. And he said, look, he said, I was abused as a kid. We were poor. I had a terrible childhood down here. My friend was shot. And he said, it's not about black and white, he said. It's about rich and poor. And, and I says, I'm not racist, he said. I, I, I'm, I stand alongside black people who are poor, just like I'm poor, you know. And, and that was quite an interesting perspective, really, and, and an insight, really, into the culture wars, because at the same time as the statue was coming down, there were protests on the outside the mayor's office. Remember, the mayor, Marvin Reese, is mixed race. He's black mayor. And... Uh, and he says at one point in the in the in the documentary, an extraordinary statement, he said, I have middle class progressives, he says, on my lawn telling me to apologize for slavery. He said, How's that going to work? Interesting. The it's four people I saw in the video as well who had just been acquitted uh, for taking down the statue, these were four white looking people yeah. who looked sort of middle class as well uh hipster kind of people and they're doing these ridiculous signs and stuff and i did i do have some sympathy and i, I think you do as well because i mean your books very you look at both sides quite a lot and i do have some sympathy with the statue taker downers i do understand that side a little bit and and uh, th their desire to do it but then seeing that video last night of these people i did think oh my god i just wanted to grab them and go like yes you're a hero you're a hero. You're a wonderful, wonderful hero. Your parents are proud. Everyone's proud of you. Now leave us alone. Because it's just like that's so clearly what these people wanted. I suppose this is this is the, the thing that is difficult. It's just if if I felt that somebody, you know, I'm from a Jewish background. If there was a statue of Adolf Hitler and I had to walk past it every day in a society where I already felt and this is a debatable thing, but I already felt that maybe my race or whatever was being badly treated and prejudiced against, and I felt like life's not that easy, and I've got to walk past this statue of Hitler, or if you're black, it's a slave trader. That That's not nice to walk past, right? Yeah. No, no, it's not. And 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 we understand that. And and, and I think that... But the, inter the issue about anti-Semitism here, I, I think is really quite fascinating because one of the chapters in my book, really, and one of the ones which I... I um, most enjoyed writing really and, and was the one on Felix Mendelssohn. Well, Matt Mendelssohn, of course, although he converted to Protestantism, was was a Jew. And 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 um really the the and in a way this this particular story of anti-Semitism is really at the center of the book because um you have uh, in 1936, there's a statue of Felix Mendelssohn outside the Leipzig Government House, a concert hall in Leipzig. And and Sir Thomas Beecham and the and the Royal London Philharmonic Orchestra, they they're touring um um through like performing in leipzig and, and beecham says well the conductor says can i please come and see the statue of mendelssohn because he'd seen it there the day before yes yes of course you can but come back tomorrow so we came back tomorrow and the statue was gone apparently it was either smashed to pieces or melted down and, and repurposed because the 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 fascist leader decided that you know there was no place for the statue of a jew um, uh, even be he the greatest of the greatest composers of the 19th century outside the Leipzig Gewandhaus. So he had gone, and 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 really, this is a is quite a a remarkable story because, of course, only a short time later, you have Kristallnacht on on the beginning of November 1938, which is the the night of broken glass, where Jewish synagogues, homes, uh, businesses, um, ever, were, were destroyed. And uh, and of course, a year later, you're into the Second World War and 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 into the final solution and the Holocaust. And 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 what's really fascinating about this particular story is that in the British Library, there was a bust of Felix Mendelssohn and an activist librarian uh, decided that the bust, whether it was removed or not, I'm not I'm not quite sure, but decided in 2020 in the wake of the George Floyd killing that the bust of Felix Mendelssohn should be removed on the mm. grounds of, quote, Western civilizational supremacy. Uh. And that's quite extraordinary and hints at the kind of cruelty that, that lurks behind these ideas of justice. But to take, and I end the chapter by, by, with a phrase which goes, a European Jew 
taken off its plinth once can be taken off again. And and only in recently, only yesterday, uh, in the news, Rabbi Rubinstein had resigned from the BBC in protest um, at the coverage of the harassment of uh, yes. during Hanukkah of the the mm. Jews, the young Jewish teenagers in a bus, and they were being there were Nazis, there were young Muslim protesters outside the bus shouting abuse at them, uh, making Nazi signs, and and uh, and the BBC reported that. Uh, There'd been some anti-Muslim shouts um, from within the bus, uh, of course, which is which is not not what not what happened. There was no anti-Muslim shouts from within the bus. What the kids were doing, they were asking for help. And Rabbi Rubinstein says, "Look, I we, we can't tolerate this. You know, so it's all well and good when we say let us, you know, take down the statue of a of a of a slaver, but on the other hand, we 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 also at the same time are saying let's take." down a bust of the great one of the greatest composers that ever lived because uh, he is a symbol of western civilizational supremacy and and in the book i i discuss in that particular chapter the composer wagner's attack on mendelssohn and and because of course wagner was a was a fascist you know he was a he was a proto nazi you know and 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 that's not to say that he didn't create good books or he didn't he didn't. You know, it's good. He didn't good music. He didn't create beautiful music or, or whatever. But, but he described in Judaism in music. He says, "I find an involuntary repellence." He said, "At, at the at Jewish music, particularly the music of Mendelssohn." He says, and and he castigated the Jews because of money, the usual anti-Semitic tropes: money, looks, speech. He said, creaking, squeaking, buzzing, snuffling. This is Wagner writing, and and he and he found no virtue in their music. He said it's derivative and rotten. So. So what I look at here is we have to find a way. How do we heal these wounds? And we don't heal wounds by making new ones. And I don't know if you're familiar with him. There's a wonderful Jewish philosopher called Emil Fackenheim. I don't know whether you've ever come across him. He wrote an extraordinary book called To Mend the World. And he has this, this phrase, tikkun. He said, do you, how do you mend when the world's been ruptured? How do, you, how do you mend it? And he was writing in a post-Holocaust he wrote this in the 1980s, but he was really dealing with the issue of the Holocaust. And he came up with the 614th commandment, and which was, thou shalt not hand Hitler posthumous victories. Thou shalt not hand Hitler posthumous victories. So I had a, I had a, a similar thing just to say about, uh, I had a similar story to, to that. Uh, one of the very first episodes I did of this, uh, a year and a half ago now, was with a, a, a former porn star called Race Cooper. And he was very, very woke. And he talks about some stuff that made sense to me, which was racism in the porn industry, which was because because actors are able to say if they want to sleep with black people or not uh, in their contracts, which I did think is really sad. It's a really sad thing. Um, but he was just saying this whole stuff about like, you know, it's no longer OK for anyone to say they were ignorant you know, he's not going to accept that anymore. He's saying, like, if somebody makes a, a faux pas or whatever, and it, then that's racist. It's just there's no excuses. And then later on, he started talking about had the Jews fought back in the Holocaust, they might have been okay. And I had to say to him, like, well, you're not to know this, but that's quite an anti-Semitic trope because it's sort of others Jewish people as though they're not, they don't do what humans do. And it's not true either because a lot of Jews did fight back and then their families were killed and their friends were killed as well. Um, and it was a really awkward one where I think now I would have published it, but I actually took that bit out because I just didn't want to get him into trouble. But I wanted to sort of say, well, if we do by your standards, because I, I forgive you for that, because I know you didn't really mean it that way. And you didn't have all the knowledge. Why should you know about my minority? You can't know about everything. But by his standards, I should have said, right, well, that's it. You're, you're out. You're cancelled now. But it's mad. But still, we haven't got to the we haven't gotten to the point, though. It still is awkward to walk past somebody who you know has, you know, traded you. And and statues aren't they? At least at the time, they are sort of reverence, aren't we? Isn't isn't it a sign of reverence a statue? I think it's a sign. Yes, it, it can be, but it's certainly a sign of cultural dominance. You know, if if you know who who merits a statue and who doesn't, of course, it's a symbol of whichever particular cultural worldview is dominant at any particular time. And and what you have to ask yourself is how do you the question I, I ask is, how do you um, deal with this issue without tearing ourselves apart, without becoming 
like rats in a sack, gnawing and tearing at each other. And, 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 and the issue here is, if we act, let us always act in a way that is likely to bring us together rather than tear us apart. Let us find civil ways to, 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 to resolve our, 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 our disagreement. So, for instance, let me give you the example of South Africa, post-apartheid South Africa. And, um, and Mandela was, was faced with, what do we do with all these statues, you know? These symbols of white supremacy, these symbols of racism, what do we do with them? Well, of course, some of the most egregious ones were taken down, but others, others were left standing. And, and Mandela made the point, he said, um, there are some people who are heroes for us, who are villains uh, to other people. Some people are villains to us and they're heroes to others. And, and so what he said is we have to find a way of reconciling this. And one of the incredible things he did, one of the statues I discuss in the book is Cecil Rhodes, of course, who is, and I discuss the statue of his in, in, in Cape Town. And, and, and it, it's really quite extraordinary because um, what Mandela did was he, he put his name to the famous Rhodes Scholarship. Now, Cecil Rhodes, in his, in his will, which he, he worked on about seven times, I believe, he, he just wanted to to leave a, a legacy to create this network of uh, of people who would who would create Anglo-Saxon dominance throughout the throughout the throughout the world, and he would give them scholarships to go to Oxford. Anyway, Nelson Mandela decided to put his name to ten of these scholarships, so they became the Mandela Rhodes Scholarships. That's, that's quite extraordinary. So why would uh, you know a black African leader who'd spent his entire life? Uh, campaigning and fighting against racism and had spent a chunk of his life in prison, put his name alongside that of a man whose values he surely could not have shared. And, and the reason Mandela gave was, he says, we have to close the circle. And, and, and this, goes, this goes back really to the issues where we're, we're talking about. So when we kneel and we make, as the guy did yesterday, we make the Black Lives Matter symbol outside there, what is it? We are really doing. Who is who is it that we serve? And and as you correctly point out, we serve ourselves. There was a wonderful paper done. Um, this was uh, last year in the Journal of Social Psychology, which looked at the link between virtuous victimhood and 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 dark triad personality traits. I saw now, that. The, the day the dark triad personality traits are Machiavellianism, so being manipulative and getting what you want at any cost, and psychopathy, which is being indifferent really to the to the to the to the needs of others, taking without feeling a need to give back. And narcissism, of course, which have a grandiose sense of one's own self and one's own mission. And, and these psychologists found a very strong correlation between virtuous victimhood and dark triad traits, particularly in social justice movements. Because what you get out of that, you get two kinds of rewards. They identified two kinds of rewards. One is uh, a material reward. Well, you're likely to get a good job. You might. It's much easier to get a job in the media, to get a book published, to, to get a, a place. And there's all sorts of, of, of material benefits to this. But the principal benefits are symbolic. We all, all of us, underneath all that we say, all that we do, we just want to be validated as good and competent and decent people. And, and this gives you that in abundance. So that gesture outside the courtroom, who was it serving? You know, I, I very much believe that that when we tackle issues of social division, so as, as a football fan, for example, I, I would like to see more black referees. But there, as far as I'm aware, unless somebody can tell me differently, there are no black referees in the, in the, in the Premier League. Who's your team? Uh, Chelsea. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, and who's yours? Uh, Tottenham. I'm sorry for me. To All right. <laughs> well, you're going to love. When we come to the, uh, what's the word I love and hate? You're going to love that then. <laughs> but I'll save that for later. Is it the Y word? <laughs> No, 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 no. And uh, but I'll come back. To, I'll come back to that later. But yeah, but but what's what's fascinating is, and I I, I support uh, uh, charities that are fighting, for instance, to to get better role models for young black kids. So they can value education, so they they can see that there's a route that they. It's not just being a singer or a dancer or a football player, whatever the the racist tropes are. You know, it's about being an astrophysicist, being a lecturer, being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, so on and so forth. So it's building these role models. That's practical work. Doing these grand gestures, these symbols of allyship with virtuous victimhood. You you are the victim's victim, so you so you are doubly ennobled. I mean, it confers on you a kind of sanctification, a beatification, and and it really elevates your 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 status, and it allows you to, you know, examine your privilege 
without having to renounce any of it. It's religious. It's pure. It is religious. I mean, there, there is undoubtedly a, a spiritual element to it. And 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 going back to the what I was saying before about 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 how we heal and and uh, and uh, Vaclav Havel, I remember the Czech dissident when he was in prison during the Czech Republic. He said, "I am responsible." He wrote to his wife. He says, "I am responsible for the state of the world." And that's on the one hand, you think, what an absurd statement. How can you as an individual be responsible for the state of the world? But but what he's saying there is anything I want to change has to begin with me. But it has to begin with me. As Martin Luther King said, there's some of the best in the worst of us and some of the worst in the best of us. So when we tear our statues down, when we make these gestures of solidarity with whomever we want to make the gesture of solidarity with, let us be mindful that we are actually serving ourselves, that we are serving the people that we are meant to serve. And by doing that, we have to see the worst we see in others. We have to see it in ourselves. Still, this, all this it still doesn't change, though. I mean, it's one thing if you're Nelson Mandela, but it still doesn't change it if you're a black child from the poorer parts of Bristol and you're walking past that statue every day and you're not Nelson Mandela. You're not one of the leaders of the, of the world. You're just some kids who might not be doing very well at school and this and that, and then you have to walk. It's easy for me and you to say because there aren't many statues that offend us in that way. I'm just I'm just hearing their voice, like the voices of people on that side of the debate in my ears right now saying that. Well, I mean, I guess we, we have to concede right. that. We have to concede it. And, and there's two there's two possible responses to that. There are there are black people who've supported that the statue should stay there um, on the grounds that if we take the statue down, if we take Colston down, we also then don't remember the victims of Colston. Uh, I think this, for me, this feels like a rather tenuous argument, if I'm honest. But that's one argument that has been made. Yeah. So, so you can't erase that from the from the, from the public landscape. But, 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 for me, you either have to reinterpret that statue, which, which, which would have been an effective way of doing it. And to be fair, there were attempts to do that, which failed. So you, you're looking at a reinterpretation of the statue and contextualizing that statue. And, and those attempts were blocked by various vested interests, notably the Society of Merchant Mentors. So, so we, that's one thing you can do. But over that which we have no control, as long as the statue stands, right, if it offends us, how do we as individuals deal with that offence if we are powerless to remove it? And, and, and I, can, I can just use a, an analogy, really, for something different. I've helped people recover from addiction. And I once did a programme for the BBC on, a, on, on addiction. And uh, the idea was, was that, um, you know, addicts are driven to drink by advertising, by the power of the, the, uh, the drink companies and blah, 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 blah. Of course, and of course, there's some truth in that. So, so but what I did was I got, I had a glass of water as it happens, but I, I passed it to the presenter and I said, drink it by accident. And he said, well, well I can't. I can't drink it by accident. I said, no. So in that moment, in that moment, whether you pick that drink up and put it to your lips, irrespective of all the other pressures around you, it's your responsibility. Yeah, because otherwise, and if you don't take that responsibility, I won't be able to help you. Because I want you to get better, but nobody can make you better. Ultimately, you have to make yourself better with all the support you need, all the, all the love and kindness you need to help that. You have to start with the individual. And, and, and in relationship to historic injustice, I mean, one person made the, I can't remember who it was, but made a rather good analogy. If you are run down by a truck, similar point, if you're hit by a truck, now that person may have attacked you deliberately or it may have been a drunk driver or whatever, but you can't change that. That's it, you've been hit. But when you come to rehabilitate and, and start to walk again, you're the one who's going to have to take the first step. And in every instance where I have helped people recover from states of emotional distress, great psychological pain, it has to begin by seeing they've got the power to change it. And that power is in their own mind. The attitude they take to their illness, the attitude they take to their addiction, the attitude they take to their sorrow, their grief. So, so sometimes we can't change things, you know. I mean, I can remember when I um, was, a, was a kid, I'm Welsh by, uh, by, by birth. So, so and, and my great-grandparents went to schools where 
they had placards hung around their necks with Welsh not on it because they were not allowed to speak Welsh in, 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 in schools. And, and, and because the idea was to obliterate the, the, the language. I can remember when I was a kid, all the protests, you, you drive through Wales, you know, and all the signs were blacked out because they were English names. And there was a campaign where really, it was called Candaithas of Yaith, which was the, 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 a campaign for the Welsh language, which was really to, to try and say, no, we've got to, we've got to oppose this. And yes, we can, we can protest. But ultimately, what are the limits of that protest? And, and, and this is, goes back to the, the old adage, which is really used to help people who, who struggle in all manner. It's very stoic in its impulse, which is giving us to di- letting us know the difference between what we can and cannot change, you know, and, and, and focus on what we can, because uh, that allows us to heal. And, uh, and really, what going back to Vaclav Havel and the point I was making about Emil Fackenheim's 614th Commandment and Havel's points in, in prison is you, you begin from a position of unconditional respect and value of the individual human being, not because they are black, white, Jewish, Gentile, whatever. But we begin with the individual. And yes, people have been discriminated against horrendously because of their religion, because of their race, because of all sorts of reasons. And let us fight that wherever it rears its ugly head. And uh, and let us always be mindful that as human beings, we are even as individuals, we are more powerful than than, than we sometimes think we are. And and it's a bit like Margaret Atwood famously said. She said, above all, she says, refuse to be a victim. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I guess yours is, I, I, I suppose, you're leaning towards what is a conservative modern individual uh, philosophy, right? And, and I don't want to box you in, of course, but that's I, I'm sort of leaning that way myself. Uh, and it is that old Jordan Peterson thing as well of make your own bed, do you know, sort yourself out before you get onto society's woes and things like that. And he gets very frustrated with eighteen-year-olds who want to change the world. And it's like four years ago you were fourteen, like you were living with your mum. What do you possibly know? At the same time, I suppose we probably benefit from having a diverse society that has those people. As you and I secretly might think, it's a bit uncouth. I guess we're all playing status games, but we feel like theirs are more obvious. Uh, they're sort of, you know, doing the black power signs and stuff outside of the BLM signs outside of, you know, when they've just been acquitted. Um, but I suppose isn't it not useful to have those people? Because otherwise, if everybody was a bit like us, like, come on, get on with it. We've all got troubles. And, you know, then, then there wouldn't have been any change. And things that have come into place in the last 10, 20 years, 30 years, like the way people are more favorable of homosexuality, for example... These are good things that maybe people like us at the time might have been a bit like, eh, you know? Well, yeah, I think that's a brilliant point. And, and true, you know, because, you know, you need a combination of conservatism, progressivism to move forward. You know, too much conservatism, you just stay where you are. We'll just be sat here. There's a wonderful uh, piece of dialogue I once watched with the conservative philosopher Roger Scruton talking to Douglas Murray. And, and Scruton saying, look, he said, I... I I don't pretend we've got a strong hand here because the progressives have all the, yes, let's go and change the world. And that's kind of quite sexy, you know? All we can say is, well, let's just hang on a minute. <laughs> let's, yeah, just, yeah. let's just pause. And, and you need both those things pulling in tension, of course, to move us forward. And, and, but it's how it's done, because I can remember campaigning against, for example, Section 28, which was brought in by the Thatcher government in the, in the late 1980s, which was... Um, which was prohibiting what they called the promotion of homosexuality in, 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 in schools, quite a repressive piece of legislation. So, you know, and, and I also was a long-term supporter of, of gay marriage. Okay, I'm straight, and, and, but I can still be, as we would now call an ally, but in those days you'd say you'd support, you know, you'd stand in solidarity, you know. And, but, but you were probably also more progressive, like for the time as you were a bit younger and things were different, and now you've moved further the other way, right? Uh, to, any, to a degree, but I, I'm not sure that's the case. I'm not sure whether I haven't actually stayed pretty static, uh, but it's a bit like the background around me has moved. So, so what was <laughs> progressivism, yeah, in, in my day, right, sure. is, is now a conservatism. You know, I mean, and, and what I have a great distaste for and always have had is identitarianism in all its guises. Because once you collectivize, once you collapse the individual into his identity group and you collectivize guilt, you open the gates of hell. And, and that is what we're doing. And, and so it, it's exactly like Sophia Nelson said, as I quoted at the beginning about the Confederate statues and her point of view as a black female American. He says, I don't care about these dead people. What I care about is the hatred we are seeing now. 
And, and, and how do we deal with that? And, and this identitarianism, it literally seems like overnight, and it is overnight. It's, it's, it was a very famous book by Greg Lukianov and, Lukianov and Jonathan Haidt, which was, uh, Haidt, which was um, uh, called The Coddling of the American Mind, which was launched, I think, in about 2015, following an article in The Atlantic. And they were saying, what's happening? We're seeing a real sea change in, in the way that students are now coming to university. They no longer want to debate. They no longer want to open their minds. They come with these certainties. And, and so what's happened is I don't believe really that I've shifted that much. I actually believe that the background behind me has moved. And I find myself, if you want, on a scale of progressivism to conservatism moving further towards the center right. I feel the same way. I'm only 32. So I'm, I've got a long way yeah. to go in the next 10 or 20 years. But I already feel that way because just 10 years ago, I would have been saying all the woke stuff. Something always at the back of my head felt it was sometimes it wasn't right but I just went along with it because that's what you do when you're 20 and you don't know anything else um but but doesn't everyone always feel like that like oh it's not me that's changed it's society and maybe it's a bit of both yeah you're probably right quite possibly right I mean that 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 you know but I you know I go back to when for instance doing my my PhD and and uh, uh and Many of the arguments I, I'm putting forward now are really echoes of really what I wrote, what I wrote back then, you know, because, you know, I, I, I always, I always despaired really of, of the way that, that, that people divide themselves irrationally into identity groups and, and, and demonize each other. And, and uh, I remember in the course of that going to Paris to, to interview a, a Jewish philosopher. He was a phenomenologist, probably one of the greatest phenomenologists of the 20th century, a man called Emmanuel Levinas. What's a phenomenologist? Uh, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a philosopher, really, who, who comes out of a tradition beginning at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, out of the work of people like Edmund Husserl. But what was interesting about this chap, actually, he'd, one of his, not so much his tutors, but one of the people who inspired him was Martin Heidegger. And this was really interesting. Now, for those that don't know, Martin Heidegger was... Was a, a German philosopher, and uh, and by some considered the, one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, who in 1933, by Hitler and the National Socialists, was appointed as the rector of Freiburg University. So you have this great scenes of Heidegger, who's standing out in with all these Nazi flags behind him, and I remember going to speak to Levinas, and I, I said to him, you know, well, you know, what do you? What do you feel about Heidegger? You know, obviously you admire his work. His work has been fundamental to yours, but but do you forgive him? And he said, I, I find it hard, he said. And and um, because, you know, how can you forgive somebody for that? Because he lost most of his family during the Holocaust. He himself, it's an interesting anecdote here, which goes on the themes of how we deal with these divisions that, that exist between us. When he was, he was put in a labor camp, during this, he escaped a short distance from Belsen concentration camp. He escaped being taken to the camps, but he ended up in his labor camp for a number of years. And he tells a, a story about a dog, an Alsatian, a stray Alsatian dog that he 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 was sent out as a to the forest to do work in the forest every day with with the, with the other prisoners. And and obviously the, the 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 Nazi guards were were brutalizing the prisoners to varying degrees. But every day this dog obviously hadn't quite. It caught on to the dominant ideology yeah? and was running up to the prisoners and jumping up and licking them and saying good morning and then welcoming them back when he came back. And, and, he, and Levinas made a really interesting point about this. He said, that dog, he said, was my witness. Where, where the guards stripped away my dignity and humanity, that dog gave it me back. And, and that's kind of extraordinarily profound. And, 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 and I think that for all of us, you know, facing these divisions and these conflicts that we face, above all, we have to return back to giving each one of us our dignity and our value as, as individuals. That doesn't mean we do things on our own because that's insane. There's not some rampant iron rammed objectivism going on here. You know, there's there's you know, we all need each other, you know, and, and we only survive and prosper as a species by our ability to work together. None of us achieve anything alone. You know, the richest man in the world, you know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, I mean, he, he, this myth about the self-made billionaire, it's a nonsense. We do things collectively. We cannot do anything on our own. If we believe that we can cut away the rest of humanity 
and survive and progress and prosper, we are insane. It's, it's a form of madness. And, and we need each other. We need to learn how to bind ourselves into a community. And going back to Emil Fackenheim's word, the tikkun, the tikkun olam, the mending of the world, we, we, we need to learn how do we heal the wounds that, that, that beset us? How do, we, how do we heal the divides, the fractures that, that surround us on all sides? You know? and, it's, and it's challenging because we live in the most tolerant, the most diverse and accepting society and peaceful and prosperous society that the world has ever known. And, and we cast it about with careless abandon and we should really be careful what we wish for. Is there an argument to be made to just stop making statues? And I've got two reasons for that. What one because I, I'm just I've never been very comfortable with religion and reverence and sort of elevating people to a godlike status and that you know and I'm aware that one person's freedom fighters and others terrorists and vice versa. So we've got a society. It's hard enough just getting on with your girlfriend or your friends, let alone 70 million people in one society, isn't it? How do you manage that? You know, it, and then the other thing I was thinking about was this poem that, and I don't usually like poems and I'm being slightly facetious because I studied literature but I've never been big on poems I can't be bothered I like the, the rhyme of the ancient mariner I don't like many others but the one that popped up in your book about Ramesses really got me they don't usually get me and it was about the, the this idea of just like whatever happens in the future there's just nothing anyway and everything's gone anyway so what's the point so, so there's two points I'm making one is do we need to rev- reverence or three points reverence <laughs> and uh, subjectivity, because not everybody's going to like the same people. And what's the point anyway? Because it'll all be gone. Yeah, and and and, and really, I, I think that that that's a brilliant question. Now, at the beginning of the book, I quote the the Guardian, his Guardian journalist, or he's a journalist, writer and journalist Gary Young, and he says, "Look, he said, let's let let's tear all the statues down." He wrote a very provocative article in the Guardian, I think it was, and he said, "Let's just tear them all down. Let's get rid of the lot, all of them." Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, you know. Thierry Henry. Thierry Henry. Well, that's definitely going. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Harry Kane. Yeah, let's. <laughs> he doesn't have a statue yet, Kane. <laughs> no, no, and he's not likely to get one either. But let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's take all those statues down, okay? And let's just go to year zero. Now, but that misunderstands really what, why we put them up in the first place. We cannot not identify with. Um, with one group or we have to identify it. It is primal in us, okay? I know about um, identity groups and how easily we get polarized and how how tribal we are really as a species and how corrosive that can be. Uh, and, and yet, you know, if if I if I'm like last night watching Chelsea beat Tottenham, you know, I can I can actually see a you know a blue shirt and I identify with the Chelsea team. And I actually I do you know, I was thinking like that. It when... <laughs> yeah. so, but but what's good about football, and, and, and this is a, another issue which fascinates me, which is about psychology, ideology, and football, because what fascinates me about football is that it's a very benign way of, of giving an outlet, really, to the, these type of impulses. Yeah, because, you know, it is as somebody once called it the most important of the least important things in life. And, and, and I think that's a beautiful way of describing it. And it's, it's a great outlet. And and, and of course, when it's done, it's done. You know, if we'd have been at Stamford Bridge last night, you'd have been cheering at one end and I would have been cheering at the other. But afterwards, that's fine. Now, let's, let's just talk about something else. You know, it's not, you know, it's not going to divide us irreparably, you know. And um, so uh, we, we cannot not pledge allegiance. But the question is how corrosive that becomes. So at the end of The Better Angels of Our Nature, the, the cognitive psychologist, cognitive scientist Steven Pinker uses uh, um, uh, a circle of concern, which is done by the philosopher Peter Singer. And he said, the triumph of liberal democracies really is we expand our circle of concern. So in other words, it's not just to our kin, you know, the, the famous Arab proverb, you know, I against my brother, I and my brothers against our cousins, I, my brothers and my cousins against the world. You know, and it's we're no longer in, 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 in that very deep in us, but we can also extend beyond that. We can love strangers. No, we can love animals. We can extend even, there's even a, a, a document somewhere or, a, or some sort of edict somewhere giving aliens, should we ever encounter them, rights. And what we've seen in liberal democracies is the expansion of our circle of concern. But that doesn't mean that we don't feel more deeply towards people who are closer to us than those who are further away. And, and if it comes down to the crunch, I, well, I used to do a lot of work in, 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 in the area of diversity. And I remember going to, 
speak at a large corporation and I, I said to them, do you believe in you are diverse and tolerant people? Like they said, yes, I do. And I said, well, imagine there's a pandemic. Not so difficult now, but it was harder then. So I said, imagine there's a pandemic and every prepubescent child, every child under the age of 12 it dies from it, 100% mortality rate. But your child gets this pandemic, gets the virus and lives. So all the doctors think this is incredible. What's happened here? So they take your child and they come to you with the good news and the bad news. The good news is we can cure the pandemic. We can create a 100% vaccine, which is going to inoculate the world, but we have to take more tissue from your child's body than your child can withstand. So we have to basically kill your child. So I asked them, how many strange ch strangest children would have to die before you agreed to the murder of your own son or the murder of your own daughter? Answers varied from the thousands to the millions, so I can't put a number on it. And, and so these allegiances are deep in us. They're biological, they're hardwired. And the remarkable triumph of our society is we become more tolerant. So the question is, with statues, for instance, we have all these statues littered about the place. Well, how do we tolerate them? How do we say, OK, that's fine. OK, these statues are up. Let us reinterpret some of them. Let's build other statues alongside them. Let's put new statues up to tell us where we are now. Let's find a way we can work with those who oppose us, those with whom we disagree, without a sense of triumphalism, without pushing them, because... Going back to the Colston statue in Bristol, in the documentary, there's a fascinating piece where protesters made a statue of a chav, which was a bald, overweight, white bloke with a fag in, a, in his mouth and a can of beer in a dustbin. Mm, we should explain chav for the Americans. We've got like 30% American listeners. Oh, okay. Right. So you're looking at, a, at I guess, a, 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 a working class. Sorry? Maybe redneck. Yeah, redneck. Redneck would be... You know, but just a just a working class bloke, you know, and 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 uh, uh, in some ways, you, an archetypal northern football fan, whatever you want to call these 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 horrendously skewed archetypes that we get in th these images we get in our heads. But but the idea was so how, and I remember thinking, how do we think taking one statue off a plinth and putting another man in a dustbin is going to do anything but divide us? How, what are we doing? What do we think we should put that dustbin on the plinth and let's celebrate? The, uh, the, uh, the, the, and demonize the working class? Is, is, is that really a way forward? So, so the question is, we will always put statues up. We will always want to venerate the, the, those things that we love. What matters is that we expand that love. We expand that circle of concern as far and wide as we can. And we tolerate statues uh, that we may not ourselves want to put up. And we may protest those statues. We may want those statues to come down. But we learn the art of tolerance. And, um, and, and that's the first point. And on the, the other point you're making, so if you look at the, the issue of, you know, in the, in the fullness of time, you talk about Shelley's Ozymandias, which is the poem you were quoting, you know, the two yes. vast and trunkless legs of stone. And this great, this great you know, this great um, uh, a pharaoh who, who, who had all the power in the world, now there's just a lone and level sand stretching far away. That is all our fate. And, and we have to learn the humility behind that. Where, where do we think we are all going? I always remember Mike Tyson when he was recovering from his alcoholism. He, he came up with a famous phrase, that if you are not humble, he said, humbleness will visit itself upon you. Wonderfully, almost biblical in its structure. Mm. Said by someone, not, not necessarily an archetype of, of humility. Well, that's right. But he had to learn it, right? Because he had to learn it because the, the man went down and out. You know, the man was an addict. The man's life was in pieces, in ruins. He served time in prison. We, we have to reckon with ourselves before we reckon with the world. And, and when we do that, we actually learn true compassion. We really want to bond with other people. Let us find in others what we, what we, what, what we dislike in others. Let's find it in ourselves. Then we can say, OK, so... Uh, you know, and I'm a humanist, so I'm not a, a religious person. But one of the 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 the, the uh, passages, really, in the in the in the New Testament that always stayed with me was the woman taken in adultery, where she's cast into the square, and and Jesus has said, "Well, you know, this woman's caught in adultery. You know, we're going to stone her to death. What do you think?" And he says, "Well, you know, um, he, 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 he want him to say yes, stone her to death, which means he's not doing anything different, which means he loses." His radicalism, or he says, "No, I'm not." At which point he should, no, he shouldn't stone her to death. At which point he should be stoned to death. But what does he do? He says, "Let him who is without sin cast the first stone." And and we should always be mindful of that. That doesn't mean we don't fight, 
the tyrannies where we see them doesn't mean we don't fight a Hitler or we don't fight a Stalin. But first of all, let us be mindful of the Hitler and the Stalin that lives inside us. Because these Hitler is not just a historical figure. Stalin is not just a historical figure. Mao is not just a historical figure. It's a way of approaching the world. It's a way of unleashing terror, division, tyranny upon the world. And we are all, each one of us, without exception, capable of that. So when we make the gestures we make and fight the battles we fight, let us be mindful. So among the statues, for instance, that were attacked, Mahatma Gandhi, for instance. So this is the, this is the, the slippery slope argument, you know. So Mahatma Gandhi's statue was defaced because of his anti-black statements, you know, and his racist statements. And, and, and so, so, but which one of us is, is, is pure enough? You know, who among us is, is, is pure, you know? And, and Sven Linkvist, who wrote a book called Exterminate All the Brutes, which was a phrase taken from Conrad's Heart of Dark. Yeah, and he, he said, he said, where knowledge is being suppressed, he said, yeah, with knowledge which could help us go forward, which could, which would shatter our image of the world, he said, and force us to question ourselves everywhere there, he said, where that knowledge is being expressed, heart of darkness is being enacted. So the heart of darkness is not in the other man or the other woman, it's not in the other person. The heart of darkness is in us. And, and if we are truly to love, really to be capable of love, it means seeing that in ourselves because it makes us more compassionate. Because if I see something in myself that I condemn in others, it actually makes me more compassionate towards them and helps me to be able to help them to become more tolerant. So going back to the work I've done, be it with people who are addicts or people who move into all sorts of self-destructive behavior patterns, how do you heal people? You have to get them to see their own responsibility and see who they are, and then you provide the support around that. So it's neither some sort of radical individualism, nor is it some you know, egregious identitarianism. It's saying we first of all need to take responsibility as individuals, but also let's reach out to each other and form a community where we can actually support each other. I've got some less philosophical questions, just coming to, coming to the running out of time a bit, but I just want to know a couple of things that were just pretty mad in your book. Uh, what did Saddam... Well, firstly, the interesting about Saddam, Saddam Hussein, because I just didn't know much, but I was too young, really. I was like 11 or 12 when it was all kicking off. I didn't realise his was... And people are... I hate this, because I know so many people listen and they're all going, you didn't know that, you idiot. <laughs> but I didn't know his was a secular regime that was against extreme yeah. Islam. I don't know if we have time to go into all of that, but what did his son do with monkeys? Well, yeah, I mean, there's... there's uh... There's some idea that that in the book I I talk about a number of the horrors really of the um, of the Saddam Hussein regime, and I talk about many of the the abuses, you know, where he would rape and and women in in front of monkeys that he had had caged up, and and that was not even the most egregious of what the the the, the regime did, and. And, and and what you have here, it's a bit like George Joffe went to Tony Blair before the Iraq war. Apparently, George Joffe was at Cambridge Don. And, and he said, well, you shouldn't have this war. You know, and, and I, I certainly thought the war was crazy. I thought at the time, and I think it now. You know, you should have this war. You're going to unleash all sorts of horrors upon the Middle East. And, 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 and Tony Blair turned to him, apparently, I don't know how apocryphal the story is, and said to him, yes, but Saddam is evil. And I remember thinking at the time, what an inane response. Of course, he's not a nice man. And, and, and if I could recommend any video to see tyranny in action, watch the video, 1979, where Saddam Hussein takes personal power, where the Ba'ath Party uh, becomes really a one-man dictatorship. And he has a man who's, who he has tortured um, standing up on a podium saying there's a conspiracy against the the regime. I know the names of the conspirators because Saddam calls all the leaders of the Ba'ath Party down to this room, and the man reads out sixty-six names, right? And they're all laid out. It's an extraordinary piece of footage, and they're all taken out, and many of them executed. Some of them shot by Saddam Hussein personally. At the end of this, when the denunciations are over, and they're all made up, of course, when the den- those remaining in the room, what do they do? They stand on their feet, they cheer. The euphoria, I survived. Long live Saddam, long live Saddam, long live Saddam. And, and of course, when Saddam fell, the famous statue, which I talk about in the book that was taken down in Ferdos Square, if you remember it, and people said, look, the, all the Iraqis want this down. Well, it was a put-up job. You know, it was, it was, there were a few, a couple of hundred Iraqis, 
you know, unsure quite what to do, pulling the statue down under with American support and under American instruction. This wasn't some mass insurrection of millions of, of, of Iraqis turning up in Firdos Square to say, yeah, let's celebrate the demise of Saddam Hussein. So again, it's a game of smoke and mirrors, but the power of statues, this is where you see the power of iconoclasm because the power of the statue being, be, being taken down was such a symbolic act, much like Colson, of course, being put into the harbor. But, but it, it, you know, but it solves nothing. It's, it's pure theatre, you know. George Washington took his slaves' teeth. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And, and That's weird. Dentist, it is weird. But it was quite common practice, you know, for, for, for the wealthy, the rich, the powerful, you know, to take the teeth of their poor, the poor, to make their, their dentures. And, and, uh, and that's what George Washington, Washington did, you know. And, and on top of that, of course, George Washington was a, was, a, was a slave owner. You know, he inherited slaves and he kept slaves throughout his life. And, and in his will, one of the things that George Washington was very preoccupied with is what he should do with, with, the, with these slaves. Because he didn't want to hold slaves. He didn't see slavery as a benign thing. He wanted to know how to end it. But, and the chapter I have on George Washington really compares him to Donald Trump. Because where George Washington, people were urging George Washington to become king, to make himself a, an authoritarian ruler. He says, no, he retired, much like Cincinnatus in ancient Rome, you know, before in, in the Roman Republic. He retired to his, his farm, you know, he, re, he retired. And, uh, and compare that to somebody who's in, in instinct uh, a more tyrannical, which in this sense was, was Donald Trump, who would fabricate the, 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 uh, a stolen election in order to cling on to cling on to power and and where we see on and the message really of that particular statue because the statue of washington i believe the one i talk about was one that was taken down in portland in oregon and we need to be mindful really of the tyrannical impulses not just of those on the right like donald trump like the QAnon conspirators and many people on the far right who are becoming increasingly authoritarian but also the authoritarianism in the left and they act a bit like huge giant magnets People like yourself, me, the rest of us, we are like iron filings, like floating in the air. And we're trying to, to stay some kind of centrist position and we're being pulled remorselessly to one side or the other. And, uh, and, and there's many factors in that, which, which we don't have time to talk about today. But one of them, which I will mention, is the prevalence of social networks and things like the like button on, on Facebook and the retweet button. But that's another conversation. My word, it was a pleasure hearing from Dr. Peter Hughes about statues, what they mean and what it means to remove them. To learn more, get his book, A History of Love and Hate in 21 Statues. It's a fantastic read and I really found I learned a lot from it. Peter is a big fan of this podcast too and talks about some of his favourite episodes, not in his book, of course, uh, but in the bonus section of this podcast, which you'll find on patreon.com slash Gold. Thank you so much, Peter, for your kind words and for coming on the show. This is my first edit since returning from my holiday in Argentina, even though the episode will be out about five weeks after my return. But it means I have a few reviewers and Patreons, patrons, I suppose, to mention. It doesn't show me who signs up on Apple, but thank you for your support there. And thank you so much to my newest patrons on Patreon, Eric B., Marius R., Jennifer, Marta, and Natalie Camilla. Natalie Camilla was pretty much my first ever listener that I didn't already know, as in not, you know, an old friend or family member, uh, back in May 2020. I'm not, I'm not sure how she stumbled across the podcast, but I really do want to thank her very much for sticking with me all this time and, and even signing up to the Patreon now. Um, everyone, keep on reviewing on Apple and CastBox. I got Gem1983 Gemma, United Kingdom, five-star rating. Said, look forward to this every week. Recently became a patron because I binged this pod. Would still hard recommend, but unfortunately not the Jordan Harbinger episode. Started off with the most jarring, culturally inappropriate story and a story about wealth and new parents. That's a hard listen for most in the UK right now. Otherwise, always enjoy Andrew's interview style and guests. Gemma, I understand what you're saying. That was the first 10, 15 maybe even 20 minutes. We talked for a long time with Jordan about his new child. I think it's his second child, but we talked a lot about um, what it's like for him. He's one of the biggest podcasters in the world to find himself being very, very wealthy suddenly and how that kind of thing um, can affect the dynamics of your friendships. And it, it does. I mean, I often find myself on the other side of those things. I often find myself going out with friends and finding, you know, I'm in my mid-30s now and a lot of them are earning quite good money. And 
we're going out to places where everything costs, you know, 50 to 100 pounds for a meal. And I'm going, oh my God, what am I going to do? And it does make you think, oh God, can I go out with these people anymore? It's so, it's so, and then if they offer to pay for you, uh, it puts you in a difficult situation because, because then it's like you owe them and you feel a bit of an awkwardness. And if otherwise, you have to go to cheaper places, but they want to go to these nice posh places. So it does become difficult. And I understand what Gemma is saying, that it's, it, it is a difficult listen in that sense. But in any case, I'm glad Gemma's going to stick with the podcast anyway. Uh, another on CastBox was Tim Welsh, who wrote great podcast. Love Andrew's style and relaxed interviews. My go-to podcast driving home after a tough day at work. Have recommended him to all my friends and colleagues. Ah, oh, Tim. You didn't have to do that, but that's very nice of you, and 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 thank you. Everyone should do that. Actually, that'd be great if you tell all your friends and colleagues. Um, that's how I get new listeners, I suppose. Thanks, Tim. I'm imagining you uh, driving home after a tough day at work and and putting this on, and hopefully each time it's an episode that you'll thoroughly enjoy. And then Sven Livesey, who I think has 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 commented before, actually, also on Castbox. There's been a few on Castbox this week. Said I really enjoyed this one. Jordan, as in Jordan Harbinger again, is bonkers, brackets in a good way, and is, an ent- and is an entertaining podcaster. Thanks for getting him on. I've heard of him before, but never listened to any of his stuff. I will now. So there you go. You had the, the sort of, um, Gemma was not a huge fan of Jordan Harbinger. Sven, on the other hand, really enjoyed Jordan Harbinger. And uh, I just love both of them and all of you for commenting and listening and enjoying this. Thank you all for the lovely kind words, and I'll see you next week when my guest will be someone very interesting. I'm recording this five weeks in advance of this podcast coming out, so I actually have no idea who it is. I do have a big list of people, and it's confusing me at the moment, but on that list there are some great names and fascinating people, so I'll see you soon.